The difference between making it or not is psychology and skill. You need both. And honestly, skill is the smaller of the two. I'm going to give you a ton of strategies this week. I'm going to do psychology first, and you're going to see why as this day goes by, because you're going to discover when people stand up and we figure out what's the chokehold on their business, 80% of the time, it's going to be their psychology. Overcoming fear. Because, you know, whatever you're afraid of, it's never as much as you're afraid of, right? You know, it's how many things you've been afraid of that never happen, right? And then the things you do are afraid of, if they do happen, you just deal with them. It's that old phrase, you know, coward dies a thousand deaths, a courageous man only once. I discipline myself. Not perfectly, but for the most part, I don't worry about shit until it happens. You know, I anticipate it, but I don't worry about it. Yep. I really believe that the, probably the most, I don't know, the most sacred thing in our lives that we can give another human being besides our love is our labor. You think about it, your labor is your energy, it's your time, it's your emotion, it's your intellect, it's your spirit to some extent. And if you can find a way where what you do for a living activates that sense of what you're made for, the master of personal development and peak performance. He has empowered millions to breaking through that threshold to achieving your goals and your dreams. Join us as we unleash the powering potentials within with Tony Robbins. Overcoming fear, because you know, what are we afraid of? It's never as much as you're afraid of, right? You know, it's how many things you've been afraid of that never happen. Right? And then the things you do are afraid of, if they do happen, you just deal with them. It's that old phrase, you know, coward dies a thousand deaths, a courageous man only once. I discipline myself, not perfectly, but for the most part, I don't worry about shit until it happens. You know, I anticipate it, but I don't worry about it. If state is everything, I assume that means state of mind, how do you stay in a great state of mind 24-7? Should that even be your goal? I think it's worthwhile to have as a goal. I don't think it's realistic 24-7 whenever having a blurb because we all have a two million year old brain. Everyone in this room has that, I do too. And it's not designed to make you happy. It's designed to make you survive. So if I said to all of you right now, like what does that brain look for? It looks for what can hurt you and it exaggerates it. And since there's no saber tooth tiger now, it says, what are people thinking of me? Will my business make it? Do I have enough money? And these are all easy things to solve, but our reactions in our gut when we let the fear part of our mind take over that Basically, if the survival software, if it runs you, you're in trouble. So a few years ago, I, I actually lecture on this now. I say, you know, you need two skills to have the quality of life you want. If you want an extraordinary life, life on your terms, whatever your terms are, you need to master the skill of the science of achievement. You got to figure out how do I take what I dream about and make it real. And it's a science. And you can model other people and you can learn. You can speed up. I've spent my lifetime doing that. But the second skill, the one that most people don't give enough value to culturally, is more important. And that is you need to alter if you want an extraordinary life. How many people do you know that have achieved it? How many have done this? Who's achieved a goal that was a big goal? You worked your ass off and you achieved it. And then your brain went, is this all there is? Who's had one of these moments? Yeah, almost everybody. And that's worse than failing because we're all achievers in this right room, right? So if you fail, what are you going to do? You get back up, you try another approach, you're going to eventually succeed. You know it in your gut if you're really driven. But if you succeed and you're miserable, now you're what I call technically screwed. <laughs> I mean, because if you're not happy with what you got, I mean, failing, you get up and do something new, but succeeding, where do you go? So I really believe, you look at somebody like, um, uh, like somebody like, say, Robin Williams. I think the loss of him was one of the greatest losses we had. He's loved worldwide. I asked people all over the world last year in China, I asked them in Japan and Sydney, Australia, throughout the US. How many, no, excuse me, how many of you loved, don't raise your hand if you liked him, how many of you loved Robin Williams? I'm curious. Keep your hands up, look around the room. Like 98%, only 2% assholes that didn't like Robin Williams. Last time, right? <laughs> but when I said this, I didn't say like, I said loved. And so here's a guy, was he an overachiever? He came to Hollywood, everybody comes to Hollywood. He said, I'm on my own show. Oh yeah, sure you are, buddy. I was old enough to remember the show. What was it called? Mark and Mindy. Mark and Mindy. It's old people in this room, clearly. Right? <laughs> he does Mark and Mindy, but he also makes it the number one show. Then he says, I'm going to have a beautiful family. He does that. Then he says, I'm going to make more money than I could spend. He does that. Then he says, I want to make movies. He does that. Then he says, I want to win an Academy Award for not being funny. His number one skill. And he did it. And then he hung himself in his own home. Leaving his wife and children to find his lifeless body. How do you explain that? I'll tell you the answer. He made everybody happy but home. And his wife said he had gluey bodies and upsets in his brain. That's all true, but he used drugs and alcohol his entire life. He suffered his entire life, made everybody happy but himself. And so I love the guy. I, I, my, one of my birthdays, I was at Tad, and 
I did this talk, which was very popular, and he came out to my birthday party. A bunch of guys took me out to dinner that night and jumped on top of the table and sang happy birthday as a Russian woman and then as a Chinese man. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I've never lost a, a suicide, knock on wood, out of thousands. We made films and follow up, but I had no idea that's where he was. But I look at a man like that, I say, he's a warning as much as we all loved him, even more so because we loved him. I know none of you are going to kill yourself. I'm not worried about that. But a lot of people live a long time, but they don't really live, you know, because they let, the, they let their stress and their frustration, you know, I always say achievers don't get fearful. We're all achievers. We don't get fearful. We just get stressed, right? <laughs> stress is the achiever word for fear. So I say to you, what are you stressed about? Well, I got to do this. I got to make this thing happen. What if you don't? Well, I got to. Well, what if you, it'll fall apart? What if it falls apart? Then it'll fail. What if it fails? Then I'm a failure. What if you're a failure? And now if, if I follow the trail of your stress, it'll take me to your deepest fear. And the only way to have your life work is to face that fear and push through it. And what is courage? Courage does not mean you're not afraid. It means you're afraid and you do it anyway. You're scared shitless, but you do it anyway. And I think if you're going to succeed at the highest level, you've got to face those fears. What is the unique selling proposition? What is what we call value-added marketing, VAM? Today, most people are sick and tired of advertising because where is it? Everywhere. In fact, I got a question for you. How many of you in this room do not even see banner ads anymore? Literally, it's there, but you don't perceive it. Like, there's, like your brain literally washes it out. Raise your hand if that's true. Keep your hands nice and high and look around the room right now and you'll see 98% of the people wash it out. So don't buy them unless you're gonna create something really unique. It's a total waste of your money and your time in the world run today. Today, what creates marketing is when you don't just market, but you add value to people. You do something, you teach them, you give them an insight, you give something valuable that costs them nothing, and then they look to you as an expert. They look to you as a person that adds value. They want, they want you to supply them more information, more experience, more products, more services. Success and failure are not giant events. They don't just show up. You don't just suddenly become successful or suddenly have this cataclysmic event that makes you fail. It may look that way, but failure comes from all the little things. It's failure to make the call. It's failure to check the books. It's failure to say, I'm sorry. It's failure to push yourself to do things physically that you don't want to do. And all those little failures day after day come together until one day some cataclysmic event happens. You blame that. That event happened because you missed all the little stuff. Do you agree with me? And success, by the way, is not some overnight event. It's all these little things. Success is having a vision. Success is making it compelling. Success is really seeing it and feeling it every day with strong enough reasons. Success is feeling the sense that I'm here to grow and I'm here to give something to the world more than just myself. All the little stuff. That's where success comes from. In business, it comes from delivering more than anybody could imagine. All those little things add up. People go, wow, that's who I want to do business with. It's true in any area of your life. Ultimately, I really believe that the, probably the most, I don't know, the most sacred thing in our lives that we can give another human being besides our love is our labor. You think about it, your labor is your energy, it's your time, it's your emotion, it's your intellect, it's your spirit to some extent. And if you can find a way where what you do for a living activates that sense of what you're made for, then work is not work whether you be in Fiji or whether you be in a, an environment that might be, seem less exciting and promising in the moment. Trust me, I worked in plenty of those too. But with the same level of excitement and passion because I found what turns me on, that makes me feel alive, makes me feel like I'm doing something that's worthwhile. And on Labor Day, I think a lot of people, uh, it's just a holiday to get away and take time off of labor. Uh, and my hope is to trigger you to think about how could you turn your labor into your love? I think it was uh, Mark Twain who said, when your vocation becomes your vacation, that's when life becomes truly magnificent. And um, I'm privileged enough to have that, but I pursued it. And one of the secrets that I found, and I know you know this in your soul, is that we all know if you're going to be masterful at something, you don't show up you know, as the best in the world at something. You don't show up in environments that you want to be in. You get there because you did things for thousands and thousands of hours. Most of you know the concept of mastery taking 10,000 hours. It's an arbitrary number. But I'm sure you've heard about it. You want to get really good at something. It's 10,000 hours because when you do something enough with enough intensity, enough intention to constantly get better, when your labor is your love and where your labor is something you have to always get better at, 
then usually what happens is you get these insights that allow you to serve more. But I also think that labor, you know, we're talking about this weekend, what makes people fulfilled by their labor is, is their motives for it. If your motive is just to make money or just to pay your bills or, or just to get rich or whatever you think that's going to be, those people never really are fulfilled even if they make the money. Um, the most fulfilled human beings in my experience, and, and I've had the privilege of working with literally 4 million people from 125 countries now around the world, the people that are most alive, regardless of the economics, are people that have found something that they really feel the motive is more than just themselves. You know, we all know what it feels like when you're trying to do for something for someone you love and you're not doing it as a trade, you're not trying to get something back, you're just doing it because it's what you're made for. And um, I always tell people motive does matter. That if you're just doing something for yourself, there's nothing wrong with that because life supports whatever else supports life. If you're part of life and you're trying to do something that's going to make your life better, I think the universe, God, whatever proper term for you, whatever your belief system is, you know, infinite intelligence gets connected to you and it gives you insights. But I think if you're trying to serve more than yourself, more life than just you, when things support more of life, more of life shows up to support you. And that might sound kind of airy-fairy, but it's my experience. You know, when you're trying to support your family, when suddenly I had four kids, three of them overnight, my life changed, my intellect changed, my abilities changed, because I was trying to serve something more than just me. Uh, when I started really focusing on how to serve a community, and then a country, and then humanity, as corny as it may sound, uh, you get insights you won't get when you're just trying to somehow, you know, make your labor happen or get the job done. So labor could be love, and it isn't for most people. Most people, I think, are unhappy in their life because they look at labor as work. Uh, they look at it as, why should I have to effort so much? And in my experience, effort is the reward. If you are doing something you love, it's there. So if you don't have it, you might say, Tony, that's all wonderful. You're in Fiji, and you do what you love, and I don't have that. Thanks so much for giving me the lecture. <laughs> I'm not coming from that place. I'm coming from the place of saying, you can discover something that you're really passionate about, but in order to do it, you got to get out of the story of what you can't do, and you got to put yourself on the line. critical to question but at certain stages. If you're questioning all the time, you have nothing but fear and doubt, right? You only believe something because you don't question it, right? Someone tells me, oh, so-and-so, talk behind your back, this, and you go, no, they're my friend. They'd never do that. Your belief, you're certain they're not going to do it, so you don't even entertain it. But if two or three people tell you that and they go, wow, could John really be doing this behind my back? And, and you start questioning it. You ever done that? You've been upset with somebody, you confront them, and then you find out it's all bullshit, they didn't do anything wrong, and you feel like an idiot? So, so for me, I think there's a time to question. And so I organize that. When I'm beginning something, I do that. And my investments is a perfect example. You know, uh, if you look at somebody, you know, uh, you know, like uh, Richard Branson, for example, Richard is this giant risk taker, right? But he questions, he's got one question. He questions within himself and everyone else. How are we gonna protect the downside? It's his number one question. You never believe it. The guy risks his life. When it comes to investments in business, he doesn't risk anything. When he was, he told me when he was building Virgin, He's taking out British Airlines, and it's a giant outline of capital. I mean, this could literally bankrupt him, and everybody said it would. So he said, okay, how to protect the downside. And he negotiated with Boeing for a year and a half and convinced them that if he went out of business, if he was wrong and lost his business in the first two years, he could give back all the jets and have no liability whatsoever. So his whole focus is asymmetrical risk reward. How do I take the least risk with the most upside? If I was going to say anything to entrepreneurs in this room, the illusion that you've been taught is that great entrepreneurs take giant risks, it's total bullshit. There are some exceptions that have, and they've gotten lucky. But if you look at the ones that consistently succeed, they know the upside will take care of itself. They focus on how to protect the downside, and they take risk where they know I'm taking a limited risk for an unlimited upside. So if I'm wrong, I'm still okay. You know, I work with uh, Paul Tudor Jones, one of the top 10 traders in the history of the world. And Paul, I've worked with him, I've coached him now for 24 years. He hasn't lost money in those 24 years on his own personal trading. And during that time, I've learned so much from him. And the biggest thing I learned from him was this asymmetrical risk reward, that when he risks a dollar, he wants to be certain he's going to make five where he doesn't risk the dollar. See, most people risk a dollar to make 10% or 20%. You won't do that. If you do that, you're going to go broke. Because here's what happens. You risk a dollar to try to make five on your own. Risk another dollar, and if you win, you still win big. You can be wrong four out of five times and still break even. That's how the best in the world do it. They don't do it by taking these gigantic risks where everything's on the line. If it doesn't go perfectly, you're out of business. That's why most businesses go out. You want to think of asymmetrical risk reward. Tudor Jones, curiously, as an aside, 
was a classmate of mine at the University of Virginia. Wow, that's and I awesome. Met, I met him there. He would cool. never remember me, but uh, but a fascinating guy. The, another aside, because you mentioned uh, he's a hedge fund manager in, in Connecticut. You did a brilliant interview with Ray Dalio for, I believe it was Facebook, yes, not long ago. Yeah. And his book is really terrific, called Principles. It's, it's, I recommend you all go get it. It's very, very good. It's one of the greatest business books I've ever read because if you don't know who Ray is, uh, most of you know Warren Buffett. Um, that's because Warren Buffett is sweet and shares and his public nature. But Ray is actually the most successful investor of his type in the history of the world. He's returned more money to investors from the hedge fund perspective than anybody in history. When I met Ray uh, 10 years ago, you had a $5 billion net worth for him to talk to you. You couldn't be a billionaire. That's too weak. And you had to give him $100 million to start. Now he won't take your money no matter who you are. When I went to go interview him the first time, the Prime Minister of China was talking to him on the phone. He was coaching China on what to do with their money. That's how brilliant it is. Yeah. Hedge fund people, if you're familiar with rich people, give their money hedge funds. A big one might be, let's say, $20 billion. He's $160 billion. But go get his book. I, he flew down to Palm Beach to my good. home. And it's called Principles. He said, I want you to be the first person to interview me and do it on, on Facebook Live. So I did. But I love this man, and he will show you how he built from nothing. He literally started with nothing. He worked as a caddy. Um, he started when he was 26 years old in a two-bedroom apartment, and now he's got 1,800 employees and $160 billion. Uh, and he's one of the 100 richest men in the world and one of the top 10 in the, that you'll meet. But his insights about how to run a business, how to run your life, we all need principles to guide our decision-making. If you really think about it, success is the result of good judgment, right? If you make great decisions, you're going to succeed. But where does good judgment come from? You know, good judgment also often comes from experience, and experience often comes from bad judgment. Right? So what I found is the way to speed it up, the way to have less of that bad judgment is. We gotta think about that for a minute. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, 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 I found yeah. that the way to speed it up is not learn through my own experience, but learn by modeling others. Compressed decades. All of us. We could take our work and think of work as being like a gift. I, I personally believe that one of the greatest gifts outside my love that I can give another human being is my labor. But there's three gifts of labor you might have within your nature, meaning you can master anything. But under stress, people tend to go back to their true nature. And there are three gifts of labor that you can give. One of those gifts we might call the gift of being an artist or a talent, or another word for it, be a truly skilled producer. Some people, the reason you know this is your gift is what you love to do is to create a product or service and deliver it to people, and you're enamored by that. The woman over here who is doing the work, if you recall, you know, in hospice, she would be a perfect example of an artist. She's not in it. She wants to make money, don't get me wrong, but she would never trade the money for the impact. So when someone is in it as an artist, and by the way, most businesses are started by artists. There's somebody who was an amazing negotiator, an amazing fashion designer, amazing code writer. And they said, I work for this company and they don't do a good job for customers and I can do a better job. I don't work for them and I start their own company thinking that the company is all driven just by the sales or the negotiation or the code or the fashion. But a company is much more complex than that, especially as it grows. So an artist is in it for the impact and yes, they want to make money, don't get me wrong, but it's not the first thing and they won't trade it. When I talk to artists about selling their business, they look at me like I'm trying to sell their child. The second gift you might have is the gift of being a manager leader. A manager leader is someone who lives to manage people and processes. They love to figure out how to maximize a business by changing the gears, creating a new process, working with people. And those people love it. Now, they are not artists in that their talent or skill, they're not there delivering it directly to the client. They want to work on the people that are directly to the client. They want to work on the system that makes this business work. And so they think it differently. They're inspired by different things. They make different decisions. Is one better or worse than the other, yes or no? No, they're just different. And by the way, you might say I have both those skills. I bet you do, but they're not equal because they're different types of skills. So you might have them both, but there's one that is your true nature, that when things are going well, you're going to go back to it. When things are really under stress, and in excitement, we return to our nature. By the way, a great company can't be great without great artists, talent, who really deliver extraordinary products or services. A company cannot maintain greatness and grow unless they have some great manager leaders who can run with the process and the people. They're both critical components. The third 
choice of service, the true gift you can give is that of an entrepreneur. And while most of you in this room would call yourself an entrepreneur and you would be entrepreneurial, by this definition, it's a little different. Most people think of an entrepreneur as anybody who starts multiple businesses. No, that's not true. Some artists are multiple businesses because they want to get all kinds of things for all kinds of people. Some managers want to do multiple businesses so they feel like they have multiple systems. But an entrepreneur is in it for one thing, the juice of risk. The difference between making it or not is psychology and skill. You need them both. And honestly, skill is the smaller of the two. I'm going to give you a ton of strategies this week. I'm going to do psychology first, and you're going to see why as this day goes by, because you're going to discover when people stand up and we figure out what's the chokehold on their business, 80% of the time, it's going to be their psychology. The chokehold on the growth of your business is the psychology and skills of the leader. Period. That's it. And if we change those two things, skills too, marketing skills, financial intelligence, recruiting, training, all those things, we train those two. Don't get me wrong, we gotta do the skills also. But I could give you every skill. How many of you have learned it before that was invaluable from some source, a mentor, a coach, an event, a university, I don't know what. Ultimately, if you're gonna have lasting change in anything, you're really talking about just raising your standards. I mean, I always tell people, if you want to know how to change your life, I give it to you in three words, boring as it sounds, raise your standards. And what does that mean? Corny as it sounds, raise your standards. Well, thank you for the breakthrough thought, Tony. I'm glad I wasted my time watching this little email with you. But think about it. Lasting change is different than a goal. You don't always get your goals, but you always get your standards. Maybe it'll help you is to think about it this way. I try to explain standards to people with a different set of words. Think of it as everybody in life gets their musts. They don't get their shoulds. Right? Think about it. Most people have a list of shoulds, don't they? Don't you have a list of the shoulds, things you should do, you should follow through on? I, I should lose some weight. I should work out more. I should make more calls. I should respond more rapidly to my email. Whatever. You know? I should get into the office earlier. I should be, you know, more confident. Whatever your should these days. People love to have their should list make me map, but it's kind of like New Year's resolutions. If it does, it's really exciting, but if it doesn't, which is most of the time, eh, it's a little disappointing, but you kind of know it's not going to happen. But when you decide something is a must for you, an absolute must, when you cut off any possible, you say, I'm going to find the way, or I'm going to make the way. Human beings, when they resolve things, when they make a real resolution inside themselves, which is they raise the standard, and they make it a must, they find the way. Think about it in your own life. Haven't you had some area of your life where you raise your standard and your life has never been the same? Maybe at one time in your life you used to smoke cigarettes or you did something and you did it for years and you kept trying to change it, trying to change it and kept telling yourself I should. And then one day something happened. Something just clicked you over. Something took you over that kind of tipping point. And inside yourself you said no more. So it was a very, very different experience, wasn't it? Something inside of you shifted and what was a should became a must and you've never gone back. Is there an area like that in your life you can think of? Again, did you ever smoke cigarettes? Did you ever eat a certain way, drink a certain form of alcohol, and then finally say no more, and you just don't go back? And notice this, it doesn't really take any willpower anymore. Because somewhere when we make this click, when we make something a must, we attach ourselves to it. It becomes part of our identity. And one thing I've learned in the last, gosh, 33 years of working with people from now over 100 countries, 4 million people, is human beings absolutely follow through on who they believe they are. If you say, said to me, well, I'm really going to work hard to stop smoking, but, you know, I've been a smoker my whole life, and I'm, you know, I am a smoker. I know your days are numbered. You're going to be back smoking cigarettes again because we all act consistent with who we believe we are. I tell people the strongest force in the whole human personality is this need to stay consistent with how we define ourselves. If you define yourself as somebody who is really conservative, you're not going to be crazy and act nuts unless you're really drunk or something, and then you can say it's the alcohol. When it's really just you finally getting permission to be yourself, the alcohol is your excuse. If you're a really crazy person, you act crazy, outrageous, playful. You don't act conservative because it's not who you are. Very often people say, well, I can't do that. I'm not that kind of person. And I always say to people, really, when did you define yourself? I mean, really, how many years ago did you come up with what you could and couldn't do in your life? How many years ago? 
most people, if they really look at how they're living their life today, it's based on a set of standards, a set of beliefs that they made choices about 10, 20, 30 or more years ago. I mean, very often we made decisions in our youth or very young about what to believe, about what we were capable of, about who we are as a person, and that becomes the glass ceiling, if you will, that controls us. There's a, a corny metaphor, but it's true. I remember one time I was with my family at the circus, and there was a person there, and they had this big, giant elephant. And you look at this elephant, and they take this little rope, put it around the elephant's neck, and they drive this stake into the ground. And I mean, you look at this and you know that elephant could rip down the entire tent with almost no effort. And yet, the elephant doesn't struggle, doesn't try. Why? Because the elephant's conditioned. And they take that elephant and condition the elephant when it's a baby elephant. That's how they train him. When it's a little baby elephant and it doesn't have the power yet, they put a big rope around it and they drive this huge stake in the ground and the elephant fights and fights and fights. And one day, finally, that elephant decides, I'm not capable of pulling this out. And once that becomes the definition of an identity of anyone, an elephant in this case, they don't even try anymore. It's just who I am, that's how it is, that's just the way it is in my life. I'd like to ask you to take a look at any place you've got a limitation and ask yourself, when did I decide to accept that limitation? And you may not even see it as a limitation, you might see it as just that's who I am. But so often in our lives, we've adapted to be a certain way so that we don't fail or so that people will like us or respect us, but it's not necessarily who we are. Joy comes when you're spontaneous. It's really hard to be truly happy when you're not being yourself. And most of us have no clue who we are. And so a big part of my work, if you've ever been to an event, you know, is to get people to do things spontaneously without thinking, because that's when the real you shows up. That's when the energy comes alive. And when you do that, when you start to connect to your true nature, suddenly there's energy available for you to set a higher standard for what you want in your life. That's what this is really all about. And when I talk about standards, when I talk about, you know, shoulds versus musts, think about your own life. I know there have been areas in your life where some point in time you just shifted and you raised the standard and your life changed. Because whatever people have their identity attached to, they live. We live who we believe we are. That's just how it works. It's just kind of like, I, I give you an example. Look at your physical body. Your physical body today is an absolute reflection of only one thing. Not your goals, not your desires, but your standards. The identity you have for yourself. If your standard is you're an athlete, then there's a certain amount of strength, a muscle tone, an energy that's available in your body on a regular basis because that's who you are. And so you do whatever's necessary to maintain that identity. Again, the strongest force in the human personality is this need to stay consistent with how we define ourselves. Because if you don't know who you are, you wouldn't know how to act. Once you lock in on that identity, your brain finds a way to keep you there. If you say, uh, you know, man, I've, I'm overweight, I've always been overweight, I'm big boned, and that's the story you've got, then you're going to always find a way to get back there. That's your settling point. That's your identity. That's where things lock in. If you see somebody who's in really great shape, you ask them, do you work out? You know the answer. Yes. How often? And they'll tell you three times, four times, five times a week, whatever. In a seminar, I'll ask people, who here works out at least five days a week? And I'm stand up. And you look around that room, and you know that they work out five times a week because you can see their body. You don't just get a result without some kind of action, without some form of ritual. Ritual meaning actions you do consistently. Now, do you think those people that are out there working out five days a week, do they have more time than you do? Or off, or anybody else? Of course not. Is their life less busy? Of course not. It's just a must for them. They must work out that way, and they've made that turn, their life changed. So I'm not saying you have to work out five days a week. I'm just saying whatever you really want, wants don't get met consistently. Standards do. Whatever you identify, this is who I am. And so it's not so much about changing your identity as there's expanding it. You know, deciding that, you know, instead of your goal is to lose 10 pounds, which is not compelling, what if your vision was to get back to my fighting weight? You know, this, this year, this month, this next 90 days, I'm going to transform my body. I'm going to take on a new challenge. I'm going to find some technique or strategy. There's a million of them that can reframe myself where I want to feel younger, stronger, more vibrant than ever before. Here's my reasons. Because I want the energy to really make my life work. Because it's tough out there, and I want to be stronger than I've ever been before. I want to go in front of the mirror, and if I'm naked, not, you know, want to laugh. I want to look there and take a good look and go, yeah, <laughs> I'm proud of whatever I see there.
that you manage your mental and emotional state because you are the business. If you are the leader, your responsibility, your job, your opportunity, your privilege is to be able to truly lead. And you cannot lead if you're living in fear. You cannot lead in a place of constant uncertainty. We all have uncertainty at times. But if you watch an athlete go out to shoot a free throw or a kicker in, in the NFL to go kick the ball, how many have ever seen that person? They're about to kick it, they're about to shoot it, and you go, they're going to miss it, and you know they're going to miss it. Who's experienced this before? How did you know? You could see in their body that they're missing the core ingredient, absolute certainty. You got the great skills in the world, but when you lose that certainty, the athlete goes down. That's usually when I get the call. I got to rewire them and get them back where they can execute at that level. So be kind to yourself, as corny as that sounds, not to be kind to yourself, but so there's more energy available to solve the problems and to build the business and to meet your mission. Because the time you're beating yourself up, you're trying to prove to yourself you really care, but meanwhile, what you're doing is sucking the energy out of your growth. I had somebody who embezzled some money when I was a tiny company, like right? one of the companies, $3 million. The guy embezzled a quarter million dollars, and I was $758,000 in debt and thought I was in profit. And in those days, you know, all, everybody told me I had to go bankrupt. And I remember I was just like so angry. There's so much anger because my business was like my child. This guy tried to kill my child, you know? So I was chasing him into Mexico so I could beat the hell out of him and put him in prison. <laughs> and, um, and then I realized in the middle of the stuff, I got to let go of this because while I'm busy being angry and pissed off, the business is going to go under. I'm chasing birds. What am I do when I catch the bird? I got to focus on how to add the value. And so take your energy. That's all you have in this life and invest it in the things you love. In those you love, in the mission of your business, and in your clients. If you fall in love with what you do, who you do it with, and who you do it for, there'll be no limit to your impact. But you gotta be willing to do it for decades, because it's all bullshit. Maybe you'll hit the lucky thing and it'll happen in 12 months. But even if you don't, even if you did, you know, uh, I got a friend who's one of my partners in the LAFC and so forth, you know, Chad, who started YouTube, for example, and $1.6 billion in, what, 18 months, 24 months, that type of thing. It's not always the best thing, because ultimately in life, whenever you meet people who have succeeded, almost always we talk about the toughest times. And I often remember, because in order to have a foreground, you need a background. And to appreciate the foreground, you need a background. So I found that the most difficult times have been the best times, because they've made me appreciate what my life is like today. I have the privilege of this stage of life, you know, traveling around the earth That's and working why, with people yeah. from every walk of life, right? A hundred plus countries I've worked in. And I'd see the same problems, even though you mean different cultures. Like, you know, going to an Asian culture, it's not about the individual, it's about the group, right? But I'd still see the same problems. And then I got obsessed with it. Like, okay, what, what's the common human experience? Because I'm seeing the same problems, even though it's a different culture, even though it's different beliefs, right? And I began to realize that there are certain human needs. And there were six that I identified that I've used ever since, and it's helped me understand. And so one of those needs is certainty. And it's the base human need. Certainty that you can avoid pain and that you can be comfortable is the most basic need. It's a survival need. Because if you have continuous pain, that's continuous damage. Continuous damage equals death, right? But what happens for people is most people, that first basic need is where they live. They don't grow. Another need, the second need, is uncertainty. Because ironically, if you're certain all the time, you're bored out of your mind. If you're completely uncertain, you're kind of freaked out. And a balance is not it. It's the ability to use both, enter both worlds. And then there's the need for significance, which is a big part of our culture today, thanks to social media, mm -hmm. um, that need to feel special, unique, important, right? It can be a very positive emotion or need. It can be very negative, depending upon how it's used, how it's directed. And then there's the need for connection and love, which everybody has. And those four needs, everybody finds a way to meet. If you have to lie to yourself, work 20-hour days, you're going to find certainty somehow. You're going to find variety. You're going to find some form of significance. Some people do it by tearing other people down. Some people do it by working harder. You know, it's different. You're going to find some level of at least connection, if not love. But the final two are what make people feel alive, which is growing. Everything in the universe grows or dies. And contributing. Everything in the universe contributes or it's eventually eliminated by evolution. So those are the spiritual needs, growth and contribution, where you get beyond yourself. And I think that the majority of us don't take moves because of fear, and fear is just uncertainty. Mm -hmm. It's that base need. And when I go around and I describe this in more detail, and I work with a big audience, 15, 20,000 people, and I'll say, have them do a set of exercises, and have them figure out where do they get, what triggers them to be certain or uncertain, what triggers them to have variety, and so forth. So they understand that like everything I do is to meet these needs. But then I get them to say, what are your top two? Not what you think they should be, not what you want them to be, what are they? And 90% of the people in our culture are certainty and significance mm -hmm. or significance and certainty, mm -hmm. even though they really want love. Mm -hmm. 
So they have this route, like if I can be successful enough, then I'll be worthy of it. Mm -hmm. Or if I can just control it enough and know it's that way, but you can't control love, right? And so most people are, they're trying to meet their needs in a kind of a backwards way. Mm -hmm. And I think that that fear, that uncertainty is what keeps most people from growing until they get enough pain. And then that pushes them to a threshold where their needs aren't being met. They got to change. And all this to say today, we'll see you guys in the next video. And I hope that you like this video. Be sure to implement these rules to your everyday success because it's on the way. Don't forget to hit that like button and share this with your friends. Also, I will link the books that are created by this author down below. Check out the description. Don't forget to subscribe and also comment below whatever you think your favorite rule to success is.